Before I begin my homily, I'd like to introduce to those of you who do not know him, Tony Vicentainer, the tall gentleman in the sanctuary who is serving Mass today. He is a seminarian now for our Diocese of Savannah. He's studying theology down in Boynton Beach. So we're very glad to have him as a seminarian, preparing for priesthood, and to have him with us as he's on his time off from seminary. I'd like you to say with me, or just think along with me, a very familiar prayer. Think about the words as we say it. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To you do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To you do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, your eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of your womb, Jesus. Do you often think of yourself as being in exile? We say that prayer many times at the conclusion of the rosary. In Latin, it's the Salve Regina, which many of you sing. And yet, it's not a concept that many of us think about very often. But it's very important, I think, to understand the scriptures for today, particularly the first reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40. The beginning of what's called the Book of Consolation, because of the way it begins. Comfort, give comfort to my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her service is at an end, her guilt is expiated. These words are spoken to the people of Jerusalem after it had been devastated by the Babylonians. And many of the people of Israel had been taken away into exile where they had been for almost 70 years. This is the famous Babylonian exile of the Hebrew people. Only those who really trusted that God would not forget his people were able to hold on to any hope of ever returning to their homeland. Imagine being totally away from your homeland for 70 years. Many who did not have that hope strong enough of returning had just become absorbed into the Babylonian culture, powerful empire. They were welcomed as intelligent people, and so they just made their home in Babylon. But there was always a core group, the Anuim Yahweh, they called themselves, the, the, the poor of the Lord, who held on to the hope that there would be somehow God would intervene. And in a miraculous way, he did by raising up the pagan, King Cyrus, who was able to overcome the Babylonian Empire, and his, his way of looking at things was, I want to make friends with all the gods. <laughs> and so he wanted to make friends with the God of Israel, and so he would pay for the return of the people to their homeland. Not only did he allow it, he subsidized it. <laughs> so what more could one ask? Huh? in answer to one's prayer for liberation and return. So the prophet Isaiah, or he's really called Deutero-Isaiah because this section of the prophecy of Isaiah comes later than the original Isaiah, um, about 100 years later. And he, uh, he speaks then a word of comfort and hope and consolation. And the church has always used this then as being spoken to ourselves also, in ex in, to the extent that we also are in some sense in spiritual exile, away from our homeland, heaven. Hmm. 
Of course, this ties in with the gospel, doesn't it? Because after he says, comfort, give comfort to my people, we hear these words. A voice cries out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wasteland a highway for our God. So in other words, how was this return to happen? There was a vast desert between Babylon and Jerusalem. How were the return how were these people to survive this journey back? And the prophet says that a way must be prepared, the high mountains must be leveled, the valley shall be filled in, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And that theme then is picked up in our gospel today, the very beginning of the gospel according to Mark. This year we'll be reading from Mark's gospel it is the shortest of the Gospels. Everyone, all scholars believe it's the first to be written. And upon it, really, are based Matthew and Luke as well. They add their own information. But Mark has a certain beautiful quality to it because it's so straightforward. And because of its simplicity, it has a certain power that the others do not in, in the same way. So. We heard the words today, the beginning of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Right from the beginning, he announces what this is all about. This is the good news about Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. He will not use that term again, the Son of God, until the very end of his gospel, where those are the words spoken by the centurion standing near the cross of Jesus. After he breathes his last, the centurion says, truly, this man was the son of God. And so he brackets, as it were, the life of Jesus with those two terms. But immediately he goes in to John the Baptist. He really speaks very briefly about John because his point is John was just the one to get people ready for the coming of Jesus. So the baptism of Jesus, which we will celebrate after the Epiphany, is the, the way in which Jesus is introduced as God's Messiah, as the Chosen One, where the Father says, this is my Son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And so the message here then is the same one. Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. In meditating on this through the years, I've always been confused as, well, who's supposed to do the building of that highway? Is it God or is it us? And I've come to the conclusion, it's both of us. God is doing it, but we have to cooperate in it. God prepared the way. He prepared the way for the ancient peoples of Israel to return to their homeland, and he prepared the way for Jesus to come. Jesus, who is ultimately the way, the truth, and the life, the one who will lead us back to the Father. So beautifully, then, we think about this way that God has prepared for us, a way that we must make our own. Maybe I, as I was trying to think of how to put this, I think a way isn't a way if we don't walk on it. <laughs> so it's a potentially a way but we have to make it our own. We have to walk on it. We have to follow Jesus, as he said so often, become my disciple, follow my way, follow me. Hmm. I'd like to close today just by reflecting with you on part of a letter, part of the encyclical letter of our Holy Father. He published this back in the beginning of October. It's called by the Fratelli Tutti, which is Italian for we are all brothers. And he based it on St. Francis of Assisi's reference. It's called On Fraternity and Social Friendship. It's a very powerful document, one that we should try to learn about. But so much of it seems to be indirectly addressed to the movers and shakers of society, so to speak. <laughs> um, people who can do something about the direction of our society, the politicians, and the, he's addressing it to everybody in the world, all the peoples, 
because he sees that the world is in terrible shape. He knows that, especially with the COVID epidemic, which has just brought out how bad off things really are, he sees that our world needs to be renewed and restored. So it's positive in the sense that he looks at very critically what's wrong with our world today, but also with the idea of what do we need to do in order to return or to rebuild a God-fearing world. One of the pl places that he speaks about dialogue and friendship in society is in the sixth chapter. And then he ends with something, and this is where I want to bring you guys in, is because it's something that we can all do. When you go home today, you can say, well, what did Father say in the gospel today? I don't know, he talked about something about we're in exile. And all that. Well, this is the main point, the takeaway. Be kind to one another. Be kind to one another. <laughs> and I might just read a little bit from what the Pope said in his encyclical. In times of crisis, catastrophe, and hardship, we can choose to cultivate kindness. Those who do so become stars shining in the midst of darkness. Let me just read that again. In times of crisis, catastrophe, and hardship, we can choose, each one of us, to cultivate kindness. Those who do so become like stars shining in the midst of the darkness. Then he goes on to say, St. Paul describes kindness as a fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Kindness is one of the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness. And he uses the Greek word Christotes, which describes an attitude that is gentle, pleasant, and supportive. Gentle, pleasant, and supportive. Not rude or coarse. Individuals who possess this quality help make other people's lives more bearable. In other words, by cultivating kindness as a way of life, we are doing a work of love and charity by making other people's lives more bearable, to speak words of comfort, strength, consolation, and encouragement, not words that demean, sadden, anger, or show scorn. And there are so many, are there not, in our world today who use words that demean, sadden, anger, and show scorn. A kind person, he says, is willing to set everything else aside in order to show interest, to give the gift of a smile, to speak a word of encouragement. Kindness ought to be, ought to be cultivated, he says. It's no superficial bourgeois virtue. In other words, don't, don't dismiss this as, being, oh, that's, that's okay. It's very important, he's saying. This is what we can all do to bring about a better world. People will perhaps not notice it, but it is establishing a way of life precisely because kindness entails esteem and respect for others. Once kindness becomes a culture within society, it transforms lifestyles, relationships, and the ways that ideas are discussed and compared. Our psalm response prayed Lord, show us your kindness. God showed us kindness in what he did for us in Christ. We need to respond to that kindness by showing kindness to others. Amen.